Hey guys, Zero here, and today we'll be talking about the much debated topic, DLC. This video is not about the creation of DLC with software tools, rather how the game creation process and the relations with the console makers influence the creation of DLC. Yes, in this video we will focus primarily on console games, but even PC people should stick around, as a lot of what happens on the consoles unfortunately affects the PC version as well. Before we get into the thick of it, I want to say that I'll reserve my personal opinions on DLC until the end. I will also try to provide an unbiased as possible recount of the industry as I can. I also want to let you know that I'm not just some random dork on the internet, I do have some credentials. In the past I've worked for two different gaming companies, of which one was quite large. Well, large enough to make headlines when I went belly up. Somewhat recently. Yes, yes, of course, it was all me, all my fault. Muhahaha, I did it. Right. Over the years I've done QA, translation services, level design, asset creation, story elements, and more. Especially with the QA department, we were deeply involved in the creation process, which basically is the process that you get your game through to Sony, to Microsoft, to Nintendo, to have it accepted and published on their consoles. This is a certification process, and it's the key to the whole difference between consoles and PC games, as far as game publishing goes, and especially DLC. So, a computer company that already has a working relationship with a console maker wants to make a game. It already has the computers, it already has the dev kits, it already has the talent, and it already has a track record proven to the console makers that it can make a decent game. So they come together again, they sit around a table, and the game creators pitch an idea to the console makers. This is not a casual setting. Business is being discussed, money is on the line, and the game company has a plan of attack. Think of it like Dragon's Den. Sony, Microsoft, Nintendo actually have the final decision if this game is going to go into production at all. So right off the bat, the console makers have all the power. Naturally, the console makers want money. And since the game creators will probably give them some of that money, there's a mutual interest in getting the game released. So right off the bat, the console makers have all the power. You want to release a game on their console, you do what they tell you to. Naturally, since the game company is paying to release on this console, the console makers are fairly lenient on what is allowed on board. Nonetheless, they hold the game to certain standards, like Nintendo Steel of Quality in the 80s, and they have the final say if the game is good enough to be published in the end. This is really what the certification process is about. A back and forth between game creators and console makers to make sure the game is not only playable, bug free, and doesn't contain any questionable content, but moreover confirms to a very strict and detailed list of specifications. Some of these specifications include when the console maker's logo appears, for how long, where, like the physical position on the screen, what buttons are called, the minimum FPS a game can run at, and so forth. These are called standards, and standards absolutely cannot be broken, else the game does not ship. Standards cover a wide variety of rules, from obvious things like the game cannot hard crash, ever, to very minute things like placement and color of logos, the timing of legal screens, and other things that gamers never really care or even think about. Due to the standards list being full of menial things that if missed will make your game be denied publication, there is generally one or more people per console brand that check these issues all day, every day. Other than failing standards, the game can be failed or conditionally failed during any of the stages of the submission process for a number of reasons, like hard crashes, impossible to complete levels, and so forth. Most of the time, the game comes back with a list of must fix, should fix, and suggestions. The game studio then goes back, fixes what it needs to, makes the improvements it thinks it needs to, and then resubmits the whole thing. So by now you're probably wondering, what does this all have to do with DLC? Well here comes the interesting part. Naturally, this is a very long process, and time, you've guessed it, equals money. Yep, every single submission costs money. Big money at that. So you really want to make your submissions count. That's why there's a standards guy, and that's why there's a QA team that tests a build every day. Maybe three to four builds every week. 
While I don't have hard figures, a single major submission generally costs between 20 to 50 grand. The bigger the company, the bigger the discount generally. You know, repeat customer, credibility, making decent games, and all that. Also, the turnaround time is fairly large for any company, between one to two weeks. During this time, the console maker pretty much recreates the same work that the developer has been doing. It has internal teams that test the game, just like the standards guys, just like the QA guys. Again, fail something major, and it's another submission for you. Hence, there's a big focus internally on submitting as few times as possible. Since perfection is generally impossible, most companies plan a two major submission approach, with smaller, cheaper submissions further along the line, especially for DLC. The first submission is generally done in late alpha, early beta stage. This way the game creators have the time to change any major revisions that the console makers might want. Remember, the console makers still have the final say and will make gameplay suggestions, which are not really suggestions. For example, if somebody at Sony just hates your control scheme, it's still functional, but it's a little awkward. They will recommend a different approach. And generally, you will want to at least include that new control scheme as an option, just to make him happy. The second major release is the one that we are really interested in when talking about DLC. Here's how it works. A submission is anything that is placed on the disc that gets sent to the console makers. This can include any content, including things that are not part of the main game. Yes, indeed, we're talking about on-disc DLC. So from the game maker's perspective, both the game and the DLC are being tested by the console maker at the same cost. You're paying 20k either way, so why not include extra stuff that you've already created and pretty much have it tested for free? So as most of you guys know, during the creation of a game, some aspects of the game get created faster than others. Also, some parts of the game get cut because of time constraints. Generally, art assets are finished around the late alpha stage, and artists and level designers are pretty much sitting on their assets just waiting for it to work. In a lot of companies, artists are the first ones to be shipped to another title as their work pretty much is over, and just the skeleton crew is left to finish the touch-ups. Even then, a lot of times, the skeleton crew really doesn't have a lot to do for 8 hours a day every day, and thus, they start to work on other things like cosmetic variants of game assets. This is how you end up with 37 different versions of the Nissan GTR or whatever other car in a racing game. While debugging and polishing the code is done up to the final release, and many times even after it, most of the art just sits there, so to be productive, these artists need to make more stuff. In the past, game artists and game developers started working on expansions. Today, it's DLC, as well as expansions. Since every submission costs money, and even if DLC content is submitted at a lower cost, it still is a cost that can be done away with. So it gets bundled in the final review copy that gets sent to the console makers, it gets evaluated, it generally passes, and it goes onto the production DVD to become on-disc DLC. Be aware of the fact that the final stages of a certification process still take a long time, and release is generally decided before the final copy of the game is approved. This means that if calculations were done well, and everything went smoothly, then there's still about over a month of time from receiving the final go-ahead from the console makers on the main game to it ending up in stores. Naturally, even more if complications arose. This means that the company will be primarily making DLC for about two months before the game is released. And at that time, the new batch of DLC will be ready, will be certified, and will probably be released at the same time as the game. Here's where we start to delve into what people find acceptable and unacceptable about DLC. Again, I'll try to be as impartial as possible and deliver both sides of the argument, adding insight and examples as I go along. On the one side, people believe that everything that has been created up to the minting of the final release copy of the game should be included with the game for free. Anything that is created after the game ships is fair game for DLC content. Naturally, this excludes purposely removing important parts of the game just to sell off later on. On the other side of the argument, the development process of the main game has effectively ended. The internal testing of the main parts of the game are also done, and the focus shifts to DLC content. 
the submission process is actually a little bit different, only if slightly, if the content was deemed as a part of the main product. The console manufacturer actually do consider it a different situation if the extra content is DLC or a part of the main game. Don't ask me why. Basically, there's a little bit more scrutiny on the console maker's side to check that the main game and the extra parts of now the main game are up to par. Another point that is often made by game developers is that the game prices have remained lower than the inflation rates, and they're trying to get just a little bit more money from the people who want this extra content. After all, DLC purchases are not mandatory. Both points are valid, and they normally boil down to what is actually being done, as in what content is being sold as DLC, how and when was it developed, and how important it is to the game. It is rare for players to object to alternative skins for characters and cars being offered as DLC, but major content, especially story-related content, is vastly agreed that should rarely, if ever, be DLC. An example of DLC that was incredibly negatively received was the Mass Effect 3 Prothean character being removed from the game and kept as DLC. The character's race was a major story element throughout the three full games, and the removal of the character removed a significant portion of the story and thus game. Other examples include Assassin's Creed Unity DLC and Far Cry 4 Season Pass. Basically, each one has extra missions, extra modes, and in the case of Far Cry 4, potentially a DLC exclusive multiplayer. In the case of the aforementioned bad DLC games, people feel cheated by these game companies as they feel that the game manufacturers have already forgotten about the main game and they're trying to cash in from extra content. Unfortunately, this extra content are actual parts of the game that were chopped off to just make more money. On the game creator's side, assuming no foul play of actually cutting content that should have belonged to the main game, it is fairly logical to release as much content as possible during the first week or two of the game release. This is where interest is at its peak and thus will translate into more sales. In fact, the majority of sales are achieved in the first month after a game release. As a personal example, I did not purchase the Skyrim nor GTA 4 expansions just because they came out too late, I had moved on to another game. This is to show how timing for DLC is very important. Another thing to consider is how the delivery system and the timing affect the player's emotional response to the DLC. For example, if day one DLC is frowned upon, would it have been better for the company to just delay the release of that DLC for a week or two? Mind you, they would have said DLC ready for launch day, but instead they just withheld it. From the player's perspective, it would seem like the new DLC was developed after the game released, while in reality the DLC was made after the main game was finalized, but not yet shipped, in that one or two months of time where everything is getting ready for launch day. Basically, what it boils down to is either knowing and being unhappy, or being blissfully ignorant. There are yet other alternatives like games like GTA, Skyrim, Diablo, and so forth have done, hold all that new content created whenever, a little bit before the game goes live, and a lot after the game goes live, and make either a free patch or an expansion pack. Generally, the player receives these types of content updates, especially the free ones, much better than the typical DLC, where they're nickeled and dime for small little things that they kind of want but not really and especially more than day one or week one DLC which is on the disc as there's more content generally in an expansion pack than in a number of sets of DLC. Naturally once again we see the problem of time. Time sensitivity is the key for certain games, especially a lot of action games that don't hold your attention as long as uh, action RPGs or MMOs. So companies must understand their audience as well as their game and expertly pick what DLC schedule works for them. Some companies do it right, others, like Ubisoft, just don't seem to be in tune with their audience and just make customers angrier and angrier as they go along. As a consumer, one always has the final decision whether to buy a game or not, but most players would not want to resort to such a 
let's say, drastic measure, as they would like to play the game in question, but they would also like it to be a good game, a full game, and not 80% of it because the company decided to chop off that extra 20 to sell it back to the customer for more profit. It is important for this player base to be vocal about the desires and the changes that they want in the game and in the company, while remaining level-headed and eloquent. Spouting profanities only cements the negative view that some game companies have of their customers. Well, I hope this has shed some light on the relationship between the companies and the console makers, and that now you have a little bit of a better understanding on how DLC is created and why there is a lot of day one DLC. Let me know your thoughts about the various forms of DLCs and what you think is good DLC and what you think is bad DLC. And also let me know if you would like me to cover any other gaming topics like the whole mess with Ubisoft or PCs versus consoles, 30 FPS, or whatever else comes to mind. Zero here, signing off.